in this week's Parsha, we have two narratives, Noah's Ark and Migdal Babel, the Tower of Babel. That's like really the Parsha focuses on these two events. And these are by far the two most misunderstood stories in the whole Torah, for sure. Why? Because what people do is they gloss over it really quickly. Okay, so this man built a boat, you know, and put all these animals on a boat and set sail and everything was fine a year later or something like that. We read them in like a very childish kind of way. Oh, they built a tower to the sky because they were so silly and naive. They thought God was in the clouds. So they thought that if they build a tall enough tower, they'll, they'll go into the heavens, right? We, we, we simplify it too much, which is okay for a five-year-old. Right? We know we have a rule that God encoded the Torah in such a way that it's applicable really to anybody. A five-year-old should be able to understand it. And a 50-year-old and a 100-year-old, God made it so that everybody could understand the Torah in their own way. So the Mishnah says that Ben Chamesh Lamikra, that a five-year-old can already start learning Torah. So on the very simple pshat level, even a five-year-old should be able to understand the narrative. So when it comes to Noah's Ark and the Tower of Babel, you know, we teach it to a, like a five-year-old, like there was a wooden ark. And the problem is that we just keep teaching it that same way forever. And, and we don't actually go deeper. You can't learn Torah that way. The whole point of, uh, of learning Torah is that every year you're supposed to go deeper and deeper into the text. It's not a coincidence that our sages say on the one hand, there are shivim panim la Torah, that the Torah has 70 faces, 70 layers of understanding. And at the same time, they say that a normal human lifespan is 70 years. That's not necessarily, a, that's not a coincidence. The idea is that every year we reread the Torah every year. We're obligated to reread the Torah every year. And why do that? Why force somebody, why make it a law that you have to reread the Chumash every year? Well, because every year you're supposed to be going deeper and deeper into the text. You should be uncovering every year a new face of Torah. You shouldn't be reading it the same way every year. If you keep rereading the Chumash every year and you're not learning anything new, then you're doing it wrong. So you have to be going deeper and deeper. One way to, to, to do that, what I personally do, is every year when we read, read the Chumash, I always do it with a different commentary. So then you can do that too. So like every year you start a new Torah cycle, you do it with somebody else. One year you do Rashi, one year you do Balaturim, one year you do the Ramban, one year you can do the Arizal, and you can do whoever. There's so many. That's the point. You're supposed to go deeper and deeper. And with these two stories in particular that are so cryptic and just really mysterious. You really have to plunge into the text and figure out what is it actually saying here. You have to go deeper beyond the simple pshat. Remember the Torah has four levels, four general levels of understanding, right? Pardes. We've talked about this many times. Pshat, remez, drash, sod. You remember this? There's four levels. Pardes means like an orchard, but like a paradise. And to, to properly enter the orchard of Torah, to really see the paradise of Torah, you have to study it on all four levels. Pshat is just a simple narrative. Remez is a little bit deeper. The, 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 what is the Torah actually trying to teach you? And then Drash is already on a metaphorical level, and Sod is on the secret level. So you have to go beyond. You can't just study Pshat. Actually, the Arizal says that if a person only studies the Torah on Pshat, they're going to come back into this world and reincarnate until they learn the Torah properly on all four levels. So you can't just learn pshat. You have to go pshat, remez, drash, sod. You have to go all the way. So you have to learn all four levels. People who avoid the sod, what you left, the chida, Rav Chaim Yosef David Azulai, one of the chief Sephardi rabbis in the 1700s, he said, what happens if you don't study sod? You have pardes, pshat, pi, pe, resh, daled, samech, if you don't do the Samech, you remove the Samech from the word, Pardes without a Samech becomes Pered. pered. What's a, a Pered? A mule. A mule. A mule, right? birth else. A mule <laughs> is, of course, you know, we, we understand what, what uh, the association of a mule. If you don't have the Sod, then you're, you know, that's what you're going to be left with. So it's really important to study the Torah on all four levels. So that's what we want to do today. Go beyond the text and go on the really the, the Drash and the Sod. Look at what does the Midrash say and what does the Zohar and the Arizal, what do they say about, the, about Noah's Ark and Migdal Bavel? And of course, there's so many questions we can ask about these two stories. But I want to focus on four. We're going to focus on four questions today. Number one, where did all the water come from? for the flood. The flood seems like the most impossible story in the whole Torah. It seems like it can't happen because it says that the whole world was flooded above the tallest mountains. So like even Everest would have been flooded with 
15 cubits of water over top. How could there even be? It seems impossible that there could be so much water. Where did the water come from? So we have to address that. Like scientifically address it. Like, is it possible even? Number one, where did the water come from? Number two, what was the ark? Because we always depict it as this simple wooden vessel. It was made from atzei gofel. That's what the Torah says. So what's the translation in any chumash that you open? It was made of gopher wood. Okay, well, that's really helpful. You just change. <laughs> what is gopher wood? Atzei gofel. What's gofel? That word never appears anywhere else in the Torah. It's a unique word. And what does it mean? Let's figure that out. So was it actually the simple wooden vessel, you know, 300 by 50 by 30 cubits? Seems pretty small. That's small, smaller than our modern day cruise ships. And how much can you really fit? Like you have ten, hundreds of thousands of species of animals. How do you fit them all? And all the food for a year and the water for a year. How do you even have them all? In, these are from different climates. How do you have a polar bear and, uh, you know, a, a gorilla in one? Did they have a freezer for the polar bear? Did they have uh, a rainforest? For, like, how do you even... This is a big problem. What about all the animals that live underground and in the neat caves and all? How do you solve this problem? And they all came to him. <laughs> That's a whole other story. <laughs> so what was the ark and how does it, it doesn't even seem to make sense. So let's figure out what the ark was. And then we're going to, so that's the first two questions are about the flood. And the second two questions about the tower. What was this tower? Was it really a tower? Let's, what does the Torah actually say? What were they trying to do? And why was the punishment to jumble their languages? What does that have to do with anything? Okay, so they built a tower and God says, I'm going to punish them by scattering them and, and jumbling their languages. How does the, the punishment, how does the punishment fit the crime? What's the connection? So that's what we have to, these are the four questions that we're going to try to address. So number one, where did all the water come from? The Torah says like this in Bereshit. Bishnat shesh shana noach, when Noach was 600 years old, which is another question that we have to address maybe next year. How could he be 600 years old? B'chodesh HaShini, so in the second month, B'shiva Asar Yom L'chodesh, on the 17th day of the month, B'yom Azeh, on that day, Nifke'u, what was opened up? First it says, Kol Ma'ayonot Tehom, Tehom Raba, the fountains of the great deep. What is the great deep? What are these fountains? Where is this water? Volcano from under the earth's crest. Okay, so is, apparently there's water there. And then it mentions, secondly, so the first thing is actually not the, the rain. The rain is mentioned next. And then the heavens or the skies opened up. So first he mentions actually the greater source of water was from the ground. Apparently all this groundwater flooded the earth. The, the rain was really a secondary thing. Now, we mentioned this actually a long time ago, if you remember, um, in, up in uh, Norway, uh, or close to Norway, in that region between Norway and Russia, there is a deep a hole. Back in the 1970s, scientists wanted to dig the deepest possible. They just wanted to keep digging deep underground and see how far they can dig and see what's underneath there, keep going as deeply as they could into the crust. So they started digging. They made a huge drill and they start slowly, slowly, slowly digging. And they kept going and going and going. And they ended up going like more than 10 kilometers underground, 11, 12 kilometers. And it was done like over 20 years. They kept digging, drilling into the 90s. And eventually they stopped. And why did they, there was many reasons why they stopped. But one of the reasons why they stopped is that they couldn't drill anymore. The problem is that it got too mushy because it was too saturated with water. So once they got through most of the crust, then they started hitting a lot of water, which was strange. The mantle, turns out, was actually full of water. Now, more recently, scientists started to do other experiments, looking at little rocks that, that, that volcano spew out and analyzing them, and they find that about 1.5% of the composition of these rocks is water. So, and then doing all these various... Um, ultrasound and all kinds of things that you can send wavelengths into the ground and seeing what you get back and try to figure out what's coming back. Now scientists are saying something amazing. They're saying that in the mantle beneath the crust, there's 
three times more water in the mantle than in all the oceans combined. Three times more. So actually deep underground, the earth is saturated, not the earth, but beneath the earth, the mantle is saturated with water. So is there, scientifically speaking, enough water to flood the entire planet? Absolutely. For sure. And that's really what the Torah is saying, that most of the water did not come from the sky. Most of the water came from the Mayot, Mayanot Tehom Rabbah, from the great depths, deep, deep, deep beneath the Earth's surface. So the water is definitely there. Now, what the scientists found out is, of course, this water is mixed in. It's really hot down there. So it's hot and it's porous and, and uh, fro frothy. It's not like pure water. And that's amazing because the Talmud says exactly that. The Talmud says, what was this water that came out of the ground? It's not what you think. Hmm? Wow. Yeah. So this is what it says. Masachet Sanhedrin. Your favorite Masachet Sanhedrin. Right? The stuff that you studied. Page 108. The page you never got to. <laughs> Did you get to that page? So Masachet Sanhedrin. It says, uh, I'm going to like skip over parts of it. So as we know, Noach would try to explain to the people what he's doing. And God gave him like 120 years to go out there and do kiruv and like, re, you know, rebuke people and say, what are you guys doing? You know, God's going to destroy the planet and you should. Yeah, that's what it really means when God says, I'm going to destroy the whole world in 120 years. That's what ketz kol basar, that the end of all flesh is coming. And God gave 120 years warning. He, he gave people 120 years to repent. So Noah would try to reprove these people. He told them things that were like really hard, you know, tochacha, rebuke, that was hard like torches of fire. And they, what was their response? The flood generation, the people of the flood generation. They would like, you know. Call them conspiracy theorists. Yeah, call them a conspiracy theorist. They would scold him and they would say, you're crazy. Uh, and also they just, they said they were very proud of their own accomplishments. These were not ignorant people. These were not just like Stone Age people that had no understanding of the world. On the contrary, they had really advanced technology because they told him, Amrulo, Zaken. They would tell him, old man. Te, uh, why are you creating, why are you building this ark? That God's going to bring upon you a flood. And then they told him, What is this going to be a flood of? If he's going to flood us with fire, if God is going to flood us with fire, we're not scared. We have this technology. It's called Alita, whatever that means. Uh, so they had a way to, they had something, some fireproofing. They had some technology to save themselves from a great fire, flood of fire. So they weren't scared. Whatever it was. And if he brings us a, a flood of water, not a problem. Uh, we also have uh, or from the earth or whatever he is. We have some kind of iron technology, whatever that means. Iron plates, iron. They have something, some kind of iron technology that we can uh, stop it. So we're not scared. That they have, if he brings something from the sky, we have a protection from that. So the people were actually hugely egotistical. They had a really advanced technology and they thought they can take anything. They were not scared of God. They said, if he brings fire, we have something to block that. We have something against water, something against the earth, something against every one of the elements, something from the sky. We can block it all. We're not scared of God. That's what they told, told him. They had all these deep secrets. So we have to discuss where did they have the secret technology? Where did they get this advanced technology that they were able to, that they thought they could take on God? We'll see where that came from later. And Amar Lehem Hu, Amar Lehem, Hu Mevi Mi Bein Akvei Raglechem. So Noach told them he's going to bring it from between your legs or your heels. Ikvei Raglechem. And he brings, he, there's a, a verse to, to prove it. And then, the Talmud concludes that and says, mabul kashim zera, and they have a pasuk to prove it. And Amar Chizda berotchin, berotchin kalkalu berotchin nidonu. So this water was that came from the ground was hot and frothy, boiling I should say, and frothy. Why? Because that way it resembled shichvat zera, the male seed which they, they, that was their sin. Their sin was mainly, they had several sins. One was the sexual sins, that they had uh, descended into complete sexual immorality. 
And so because they sinned that way, so the water that came up was similar to that in appearance. So they were punished, midah keneged midah. That's how God always punishes, measure for measure. And they had various other sins. The Torah says that the, the land was full of Hamas, the Timaleh, that Hamas, yeah, Hamas. Hamas, yeah, not the terrorist group. But it's not a coincidence that the terrorist group is called Hamas, because in the Torah, Hamas means violence. And so the land was full of violence. More specifically, the definition of Hamas. Do you know what the definition of Hamas is? No. Hamas is more than theft. Gezel is theft. Gezel is theft. What's the difference between theft, Gezel, and Hamas? That's Gneva. Gneva is kidnapping, officially, because the Ten Commandments say Lotignov, and the Ten Commandments are all punishable by death. So when the Ten Commandments say do not steal, really, a lot of our authorities say it really means do not kidnap, do not steal people, do not traffic people. Because... Because petty theft does not carry a death penalty. Yeah. But the Ten Commandments all carry a death penalty. So when the Ten Commandments say Lotignov, mm-hmm. we, we associate, we generally say that Gneva refers to stealing and trafficking people, which is a horrendous crime even today, that people are still being trafficked all over the world, children, women, and others, <laughs> slaves. So that's, a, that's Gneva. Gezel is petty theft. And then in between you have Hamas. Hamas is when you take something that's not yours by force. And that perfectly explains the terrorist organization Hamas. So that's not a, it's interesting that they chose that name for themselves. Uh, Yeah, Yeah, I'm sure they, (laughs) whatever it is, they, they, they call themselves Hamas. And it's funny that in the Torah, Hamas is exactly when uh, it's like robbery, like armed robbery is Hamas, which is precisely what they're doing. So that's not a coincidence. So there was many sins to the pre-flood generation, and we'll see more exactly what those sins were. So the idea is that the Talmud is telling us a secret that is actually quite true, that the water came out. Most of the water in the flood actually came out from the ground, not from the sky. Mostly came from the ground. It was from deep underground. It was boiling hot and frothy, just as we know that water in the mantle really is. Any questions about number one? Yes. Yeah. No, the crust wasn't touched though. It's coming from beneath the crust. The crust is, is 10 kilometers of rock. Yeah. No, it's only 1.5%. First of all, the mantle, it's a, this is only 1.5% of the mantle. One, that's all. The mantle is massive. The mantle stretches for like 400 miles underground. So 1.5% of that is water. So it's not going to... And plus the crust on top, that's the actual hard part. That's like 10 kilometers of rock. So the integrity shouldn't, just by removing the water, shouldn't really affect the, in, the integrity of the overall structure. Question number two, what was the ark? More interesting. What was this? Was this really like a small wooden boat, that relatively small, that had all these animals set on it? So we know what the Torah says. God told uh, Noah, Aselecha tevat atzei gofel. Okay, so it's called a teva, which is an interesting word in itself, and it was made of primarily of atzei gofel. What is this atzei gofel? Rashi says, if you open up Rashi on this, he says, what does the word gofer mean? Again, this word never appears anywhere else in the Torah. Rashi comments, what is this? It says, gofer kachshmo, this is the name of this, supposedly this tree. Velama mi min like where does this come from? Al shem gofrit. It says, I'd say gofer al shem gofrit. Wow. What is gofrit? Brimstone? Exactly. Gofrit is brimstone, which is the classical name for sulfur. 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 sulfur, the element sulfur. You know that expression of fire and brimstone? Mm-hmm. And so that's what Rashi is connecting it to because that they were wiped out, the people, with sulfur, with brimstone, so with Sodom. fire and brimstone. Hmm? Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah, but this is talking about Noah, about right. the flood. So that's strange. Rashi is connecting it to sulfur, very interesting, to brimstone. So is this, what kind of tree has sulfur I mean, all proteins have sulfur, but not that kind of sulfur that we're talking about, right? Uh, So already we have something strange here. What is this sulfurous substance? And what's interesting is, what is the most valuable stone in the Torah? Not, I mean, not not in the modern 21st century. 
sapphire. We always talk about sapphire, that God's throne, as if is described that metaphorically as being made of sapphire. The staff of, Mo, of Moshe was made of sapphire. Even the Ten Commandments, what the, the, the tablets of stone, what stone were they engraved on? Our tradition is that they were engraved on sapphire, on sapphire. It's not like in the movies. Like just, yeah, you know, it wasn't like a gray stone or like a limestone. So now the question is, is Sapir, when our sages talk about Sapir, when the Torah talks about Sapir, does it mean, when the Tanakh mentions Sapir, does it mean sapphire? Because some people say it wasn't actually sapphire. It was a different blue stone, which was a lot more common in that area at that time, which is lapis lazuli. Lapis lazuli is a lot more common, similar, similar color, it's blue. Sapphire is more like uh, kind of see-through, whereas lapis lazuli is more solid. Right. But some people say that sapphire is really talking about lapis lazuli. But why do I mention it? Because what is it that makes the lapis lazuli blue? It's sulfur ions. It's actually made blue because of sulfur. So it's really interesting. Because Rashi is saying that it's something sulfurous. It's not so much like a tree, but it's more like elemental, more like maybe a stone with sulfur. And then the Talmud comes in, back to that same page, Sanhedrin 108, and the Talmud says, what is this? Asking the same question. My gofer, what is this gofer? And it gives a couple of opinions. And one of the opinions is that it's golamish. Golamish is a stone. It's like a boulder, a boulder. So the boulder was a stone? Maybe. They're saying that it's the, the, this thing is some kind of stone. We actually say exactly. golamish is related to a word that we say in Hallel. Where did you hear this word before? Say what? Hallel. You know when we pray Hallel on the holidays? Mm -hmm. okay. What's well, one of the psukim that we say from Tehilim? Aofchi hatsur agamayim chalamish lemayanomayim. That we say, we recall the miracle of how God, where did the water in the wilderness come from? God brought them water for 40 years in the wilderness. From where did he bring the water in the wilderness? From a stone. Very famous. What is, and that's what we say in Hallel, that God, that God turned a stone into a, a pool of water. He took a chalamish, a boulder, and turned it into into a fountain of water. And now the sages in the Talmud are connecting this water-giving stone to Noah's Ark. That might solve another mystery of where do they get fresh water on the Ark. They probably didn't drink the seawater or sulfurous water or more water from the mantle or whatever that was. Where do they get fresh water for a year? Could be from the stone. The Talmud is making that connection. How, how would it flow, though? How would it flow if it's made out of stone? Good question. Let's see. We don't know. We don't know if it was stone. We're not sure. This is, these are suggestions. What, what exactly, what kind of, this was some kind of special mineral here. Uh, the idea is to recognize that this was not just some simple wooden vessel. That's the idea. And this also solves the problem of the, of the water, perhaps. More importantly, the Talmud said, or sorry, Bereshit, it says that God also told Noah to make a tzohar. It said, tzohar ta'asel ha'teva. Make a tzohar. What does that mean? What's it saw? So the, the shot translation is he made a little window, right? Like in every children's book, you have a little wooden boat and a little window on top. And Noah is smiling stand out of the window with all the animals <laughs> in every children's book cover. It's like that. So we say it's just a little window. Again, saw is a unique word. We don't see that anywhere else. When you have a unique word, it must have a unique meaning. What is this? We can already think that somehow it must be related to Tzoharaim, that to the afternoon, right? maybe Zohar, which means light giving. Uh, so what does this mean? Bereshit Rabbah, the Midrash, starts by saying, chapter 31, verse 11, Rabbi Abba, uh, Abba Barkahana Amar, that it's a chalon. Okay, that it's some kind of window. That's pshat. Rabbi Levi Amar, that it was, a, it was margaliot, that these were some kind of stones. Rabbi Pinchas, Mishum Rabbi Levi Amar, Kol Shnei Masar Chodesh Shaya Noach Bateva, for the entire 12 year period that Noach was on the ark. Did I say 12 year? 12 month. During the entire 12 month, Shnei Masar Chodesh Shaya Noach Bateva, Lo Tzarich Lo La Or Achama Bayom, Velo La Or Alevana Balayla. He did not need the light of the sun or the light of the moon. So apparently, this was not a window, because he didn't need to see outside. 
Ella, what was it? There was a margalit. He had some kind of special stone. Haitalo, he, he hung it up in the ark. And based on that stone, it would basically tell him the, what was going on night and day. Okay. The Midrash Yalkut Shimoni adds to that. Yalkut Shimoni, it's my favorite Midrash. Mike knows it's my favorite Midrash. Uh, Mike and I tried, remember this? Uh, what was this, like 10, 11, 12 years ago? Was it that long ago? Yeah. No way. <laughs> yeah. We, tr- we, took it, we tried to translate the whole Yalkut Shimoni into English. We undertook this, because uh, there's no English translation, I there's think, no, even... Is there? I think to this day, there's no English translation of it. It's my favorite Midrash. I think it's amazing. So I, we tried, we, we worked on it for like on and off for like a year. And then after a year, we did like, what, like eight chapters of it out of 2000. And we're like, okay. Yeah. And then that didn't, uh, that didn't go anywhere. But I even had the dough. I, I even... It didn't go anywhere. Then. No, it, it was good while it lasted. But, <laughs> no, I even had the domain. I bought the domain, yelkutshimoni.com. And we like, we put, it was good for, but then... Yeah, it was, it was a daunting task. It's like you need a, a team of people working um, round the clock to translate. But it's fascinating if you... Yelkut Shimoni is very good. So what does it say? Rabbi Meir Omer on this verse, on Tzor Teva, Even achat shel margalit aita. So again, it's saying he had some kind of special stone. And it was hanging. Aita tluya bateva. It was hanging in the ark. Ve'aita me'ira lechol abriyot. And it would give light to all the creatures that were there. Shiva tocha, kener shumir betocha bait, like a, it's almost like a candle in a house. Ukeshemesh azeh shu ma'ir betzoraim, like the sun in the afternoon. That's why it was called the tzor. So it would appear like the sun to them. So this was some kind of like optical illusion for the all the animals to to have a, like an artificial light night and day where it would glow during the day and go dark during the night, it gave them an artificial sun and moon. So this ark is now becoming some kind of artificial ecosystem. A spaceship. Perhaps. <laughs> we'll get to that. We'll get to that. What's interesting is that Avraham is said to have a very similar stone. The Talmud in Bava Batra says that Rabbi Elazar Amudei Omer, uh, that Avraham originally had a stone over his chest of an astrological stone, a special astrological stone. And all the kings of the world would come to him to consult with him because he was a master originally, a master astrologer, astronomer, astrologer. Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai Omer, we all know Rashbi, Even Tova Haitat Tluya Betzvaro, he had again a special stone that was around his neck. And with that, he could do all kinds of things. <laughs> that he could heal people by just by looking at it and so on. And, um, and uh, anyway, he concludes by saying that when, when Avraham died, God took that stone up to the heavens. But, so it, it, Avraham seems to have had that special stone, similar special stone, some kind of astronomical. Could it be the same one that Noah had? It's possible. Did Avraham and Noah meet? I was going to ask you, what's the, what's the connection? We know there were 10 generations from Adam to Noah and 10 generations from Noah to Abraham. Did, did Noah and Abraham meet? I believe they did, no? They did. They met. Did Abraham and Noah meet? Yes, and there's a very easy way to remember it because if you look at the years, what year was Abraham born in? Who knows? The Jewish year. 1948, the Jewish year, 1948, from the creation. So he was born in 1948. What year did Noah die? 2006, on the Jewish year. So how old was Avraham when Noah passed away? 60-ish. Yeah, he was 58. 1948 plus 58 is 2006. What's an easy way to remember that? Avraham was 58 years old when he met Noah before he passed away. How do you know that? Because the gematria of Noah, Nun, Chet, Nun is 50, Chet is 8, Noah is 58. So it's hinting to you really that the, the prophetic tradition went directly from Noah to Avraham and they actually met. And some say Noah actually gave the special staff of creation. Noah passed it on to Avraham. 
God, we read in Pirkei Avot that God made 10 special things in the twilight of the last day of creation, 10 special things, including the tablets upon which the Ten Commandments were written and also the staff of Moses. The staff of Moses God made and that originally gave to Adam and then it passed down to Noah and Noah gave it to Abraham. So from Noah to Shem, Shem to Ever and Ever to Abraham. Right, so some say that it went by way of Shem, that Noah gave to Shem and Shem, Shem met Abraham too. After the war with the kings, Shem, who went by the name Melchizedek, yes. and we'll see why his name was changed. We'll come back to that. I mean, we can answer it now. Why was his name changed? He was Shem, then he became Melchizedek. Well, everybody's name changed because the tower, God dispersed them and confounded their languages. So obviously their names were different now. They had Hebrew names, and now he got scattered to China. He's not going to have a Hebrew name anymore. Now he has a Chinese name. So everybody's name changed. Yeah, right. Uh, so Shem became Melchizedek and Avraham met Melchizedek. So some say it was in that point that Shem gave Avraham, passed on all these things, or that Noah passed it on to him in his last year of life. You know, he gave it to Avraham and then he passed away. No, Avraham was 58 and Shem, uh, well, Noah was 950. So it was 2006 on the Jewish year. Back to the ark. What was the ark? So we're seeing some things that it wasn't just a simple chunk of wood. Uh, how did you fit all these animals into it? It's impossible. You can't fit every species of animal on Maybe such a small genetic, vessel. Like Plus all the stuff that they need. How would you even feed them all? I know we have these, these traditions <laughs> that Noah spent like, you know, all his time feeding them. And when he was done, you know, one He's round of meals. Too, too, right? Yeah, after he became a, yeah. a farmer. So, yes, we do have uh, passages that tell us, not in the Torah, but elsewhere, that Noah really spent all his days feeding them. You know, as soon, when, by the time he was done breakfast, it was time for lunch. And by the time he was done lunch, it was time for dinner. But that's like physically impossible. If you're talking about having thousands of species, it's just not, I mean, just to feed the kids three times a day is hard. Imagine feeding. <laughs> the root species yeah. of everyone. I mean, there are root species for, you know how species can become, you know. Well, our assumption is that they have not suddenly evolved super fast in the last 4,000 years. Okay. Our assumption is the species that exists today existed then. Right. So could, so. It, be genetic? could it be genetic? What he, what, what he brought in, basically, were, were genetic, um, what do you call it? Um, Again, that would imply that afterwards they must have diversified super fast to produce all the species. But we don't have any evidence for that, neither scientific nor Torah. We're assuming that every species that exists today existed then, except the ones that we've caused to go extinct. extinct yeah. <laughs> so there would have even been more. How did he fit them all in? And how would you feed them? And how would you control the climate and all that? These are all big problems. I'm going to suggest uh, an answer based on the Zohar. And I think this solves the problem really neatly. Because there's another arc that the Torah talks about. What's the other ark that the Torah talks about? The Ark of the Covenant. Aron Abrit. We have the Ark of the Covenant where the Ten Commandments were and all that, the, the tablets and the Torah. And so the Aron Abrit, the Ark of the Covenant. Now, what do we know about the Ark of the Covenant? There's a very famous tradition that we have about the Ark of the Covenant that our sages mention. Exactly. Exactly. So the Talmud says in many places, including in Masachet Yoma, Amar Rabbi Levi, Davar ze masorot be'adeinu, we have a very well-established tradition in our hands, me'avotenu, going all the way back to the beginning, something that is without doubt a very deeply established tradition of which there is no, nothing to even debate. Makom Aron, the place of the, the space of the ark, eino minamida, it had no dimensions. The ark was dimensionless. Meaning, in Bava Batra it mentions this as well and explains it. It quotes him saying, the Amar of Le, uh, Rabbi Levi, that we have a Masoret Be'adeinu Me'avotenu Makom Aron Uchruvim Eino Minamida and the Kruvim, the angels that were on top, were dimensionless. How do we know? Or what do we, what, how? Because it says, it say, Tanya Namiachi, Aron Sha'asa Moshe, Yesh Lo Revach, Eser Amot, Lechol uh, Ruach Veruach. So the Ark was the space around the ark, sorry, was 10 cubits. On each side, the ark was sitting in this room in the Holy of Holies, yeah? 
The ark was resting in the Holy of Holies. And the ark had its dimensions, presumably, and yet the space between each wall of the ark to the wall of the room was 10 cubits, and the room itself was 20 cubits. So the Holy of Holies, the Kodesh HaKodeshim, the Holy of Holies, was a room that was 20 cubits wide. And from, the, from the wall of the, of yeah. the room to the wall of the Correct. And one side Correct. To now, one side the, the Ark of the Covenant is sitting in the middle. Yeah. Let's say it's five cubits, the Ark of the Covenant. So how much space should be between the wall and the Ark? So the whole thing's 20. You have a thing that's five in the middle. So you should have seven and a half and seven and a half. And yet, the Talmud says, when you actually went there with a the measuring tape and you measured from the wall to the Ark, it was 10 on this side and 10 on that side. As if the ark took up no space. It was a dimensionless thing. It was like of no space or of infinite space. It had space, but it didn't have space. So there was, it was a dimensionless, it had no midah. It was another dimension. It was a dimensionless space. Yeah, it was another dimension. Right. It was like as if it was from another dimension or another dimension. So you had 10 cubits on either end. It took up no space. It had infinite space. What does that have to do with Noah's Ark? This is an Ark and this is an Ark. In Hebrew, they're different. This is called an Aron, Aron Abrit, and this is called a Teva. So it doesn't seem like there's a connection between them. But the Zohar says, wait, 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 not so fast. The Zohar says, Man tevada. What is this Teva of Noah? The Zohar on Parashat Noah says, what is the Noah's Ark? You know what it is? The Zohar says, Aron Abrit. It's the Ark of the Covenant. It's the same thing. How do we know? There's a beautiful, beautiful connection here. You're going to love it. I mean, if you like Talmudic reasoning, you're going to love it. Because one of the ways that we, how do we interpret what, there's 13 main principles. It's in the Siddur every morning, right? Rabbi Ishmael, the 13 principles of Torah interpretation. One of them is called Xerah Shava, where you have one unique word here and one unique word here. You can connect them. There must be some connection between them. What's the connection here? So the Zohar is telling you that Noach's, the Ark of Noach was actually like the Ark of the Covenant. There are very, how, how do we know? Because with Noach, Ktiv, Ktiv Be, Brit, the first time that the word Brit actually appears in the Torah is with Noach. The first time God makes a covenant with anybody wow, is with Noach. Okay. That's where Brit comes in. That is the quintessential. When a word appears for the first time, that means that it is the essence of that word. We've said that before many times. If you want to know the true essence of a word, look where it appears for the first time in the Torah. That's where it makes its grand opening. That's where its real meaning lies. The first time the word Brit, covenant, appears in the Torah is with Noach. After, after this and what, what is the pasuk there? Dichti, ve'akimoti et briti itcha. God says that I will establish my covenant with you, with Noach. Okay. And then we see the Zohar says, ve'ad itkayem be'brit, until that covenant was not fulfilled, lo aya letevuta. He did not letevuta, that he did not go into his ark until that brit, that covenant was established. And what is the, look at the full pasuk, what does it say? Dichti ve'akimoti et briti itcha, the verse says, I will make the covenant with you, uvata elateva, and then you will go into the ark. So what was this ark? It was an ark of the covenant. When he made that covenant with Noah, he said, now go into the ark. And, that's, wow. and what does it say? And then the Zohar concludes, Because the Noah's ark was like the ark of the covenant. So I guess you can fit, like you, you can... Exactly. Like another dimension. So, you walk in and there's no... Place, right? like so dimension. Noah's ark was also dimensionless. So we're saying that it was 300 cubits by 50 by 30 on the outside. That's what it looked like. But when you stepped inside, it had no walls. It had no dimensions. It was an entire ecosystem. It had an st- artificial sun and moon and astronomical map, perhaps. Yeah. Now, now, you ha- now you can explain why the polar bears went to the Arctic and the gorillas went to the jungles of Africa inside the ark. Every, every animal had its niche. It was in its own dimension. And I guess there was vegetation and everything. Yeah, whatever you needed. Why not? Yeah, you could have an entire ecosystem inside. Now Noah has time to sit and learn Torah. He doesn't have to feed all the animals all day. Now he can be a real prophet. <laughs> so that's what the Zohar is suggesting here. That just like the Aron Abrit was a dimensionless thing, so is Noah's Ark.
There's another beautiful thing that I heard from Rav Yitzhak Ginsburg, which is why then does the Torah make the dimensions 300 by 50 by 30? What's the significance of those dimensions? There must be significance to it. If God said 300 by 50 by 30, so Rav Yitzhak Ginsburg points out, I'm not sure where, where his source for this was, but if you take the gematria, 30 is, is Lamed, and 300 is Shin, and 50 is Nun. Lamed Shin Nun Lashon. And it's the secret of speech. He's saying, suggesting that Noah actually created it. How did he create it then? He didn't sit there with wood. He wasn't a carpenter that was cutting wood and putting together this thing. How did he create it? He created it through Lashon, through the powers of speech, through the powers of Sefer Yetzirah, through the powers of, just like God created the whole universe through speech. God spoke the universe into existence. Right. Noach spoke. He used his prophetic abilities. He spoke the ark into existence through Lashon. That's why its dimensions spell Lashon. And then he had 120 years to go around and do Kiruv and, and bring people, try to uh, rebuke people and wake people up unsuccessfully. So he had the secret of divine speech. And that's a perfect segue into the so Tower episode. Why is it that he didn't try enough? You know, because they look at Abraham, he didn't try enough. And yeah. He would argue, you know, oh, no, but what if he gave 40? up? What yeah. if there's 20? What if there's 10? That's why, right. You know? We blame Noah partially that he didn't do enough. He should have done more. That he, he probably kind of thought, ah, they're not going to... We saw how they, in the Talmud says, that he tried to convince them, and the people said, nah, we're not we scared. Do. Yeah, we got technology for everything. So they had secret ability, so did he. So he was able to build this, apparently, through the Lashon, through divine speech. And that connects us now to the Migdal Bavel, to the Tower of Babel, because that's all about speech. Nothing is coincidental here, right? Every word in the Torah, every number in the Torah has meaning. So the Torah is telling you that the dimensions of the ark externally were lashon, were speech. And now the very next story starts by saying, the next major narrative here, ve'i kol ha'aretz, the whole world, the whole land, was safa achat, was one language, udvarim echadim, and unified words. Everybody spoke one language. What did they speak? What was this language? The Balaturim, Great commentary. If you like Gimatria, read the commentary of the Balaturim. One of my favorites. What is Safa Achat? The Balaturim says, Safa Achat be Gimatria, Lashon HaKodesh. Okay, the Gimatria of Safa, Safa Achat is Lashon HaKodesh, the holy tongue. Hebrew, the language of creation. God, God spoke the universe into existence using the Hebrew letters. We talked about Sefer Yetzirah before and the 32 paths of wisdom and how God crafted the universe with the 22 letters. They got off the... Ark. They started rebuilding. Ararat. Right. They got off in the mountains of Ararat. Then they, they started to build a settlement. And then this is what the Torah says. What happened? They left from Kedem. And we have to see what that means. Perhaps from the east. Yeah. They left from there. And they found. And they found a valley in the land of Shinar. Okay. So why is that important? They found a valley? Okay. No, not a valley, because something else. Let's see. Let's see. They found something. They found a valley. Sounds strange. Vayashvusham. So this is what really happened, to answer your question. They got off the ark. They started growing. And then they said, we need to find a better place. They started moving. They moved away from Mikedim. And they found this nice valley in Shinar, which is somewhere in Mesopotamia, where Babylon is. Shinar, some people say, means Shnei Nahal, that between the rivers, which is literally what Mesopotamia means in Greek. Mesopotamia in Greek means between the rivers, because it's between the rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. And so Shinar, between the rivers, even though it's an Ain, but it's like Shnei Nahal, like between the two rivers. So they found a valley in Shinar. Okay. Ve'eshvusham, and they settled there. And they said, Ve'yomru ish el re'eo, each person said to his fellow, Hava nilbna, let's build levenim, Let's build bricks, apparently, stones, bricks, the nisrefa lisrefa, and burn to burn, very bizarre language. Vetilaem alvana leeven, and then they made the, uh, whatever this is, the bricks into stones, veachema rayalahem lachomer, and they had some kind of substance, some kind of thing, material, material masonry, cement, whatever it was. 
Ve'yomru, Hava, and then they said, let's nivne lanu ir umigdal. We're going to build a big city and a tower, ve'rosho b'shamayim, and its head, the, the head of the tower, the top of the tower will be in the skies, ve'nase lanu shem, and we'll make a name for ourselves. Okay, what does that mean? What does it mean, make a name for yourself? They found a valley, that's weird. They're making stones, they want to burn something to burn something, and now they want to build a city with a tower in the sky, and we're going to make a name for ourselves. Okay. And God came down. God came down to see the city and to see the tower that these Bnei Adam built. Look what they did. They are one people. And one language. So, and this is what they're doing. This is what they're starting to do. If I don't stop them, then they will be able to do anything. They will actually succeed. God is saying they will succeed on everything they endeavor to do. They will take over. Very strange. What, God is now feels threatened almost by this? What is going on here? None of this makes sense. So, a bunch of questions. They found a valley. Who cares? What does that mean they found a valley? Why are they burning to burn? Nisrefa lesrefa. What are they burning to burn? Why do they need to make themselves a name? Why is God so worried about what they're trying to do? If this is just ignorant people building a silly tall tower, what is going on? And actually the Sanhedrin on the next page, 109a, says exactly this, that when it comes to the story of Babel, it says the sages of Israel would, look what it says, Dora plaga en laim chalikoramba. That's how it starts. The, the generation, the dispersion generation, this generation has no share in the world to come. Mayavud, <clears throat> so what do they do? So they said, Nivne migdal venalel lerakia, we're going to build a tower to go up to the sky. Venakeoto bekardumot, kideshe azovu memav, so, so that he won't flood us again. That's what they wanted to do. That's how people explain it. Yeah, so that. That's very interesting because what they're saying is that we're going to go up into the atmosphere, into the rakia, beyond the rakia. Yazubu memav is that we should puncture his waters. Exactly. Which, which, which are the waters that he placed when he divided exactly. the waters from... Exactly, That's exactly. Incredible. We're going to go up against him. We're going to prevent another flood from ever happening again. That's what we're going to do. But the sages of Israel, machu ale b'marava, they said they would laugh at this. You're making such a simple interpretation here that they literally, they tried to build a tower to the sky and they thought that they're going to like break... Their, it seems silly. They would laugh at this. And they even said, imken... If that's the case, they should have batura. They should have built the tower on a mountain, not on the valley. The valley, you're just making yourself more labor. Why, if you're trying to go oh, to the sky, why build it in a valley? <laughs> build it in a, on a high ground. This makes no sense. So the sages of Israel are, are already pointing out flaws in the simple narrative. That doesn't seem to make sense. What's with this valley? Let's go to the Zohar. The Zohar says, Patacha bichia ve'amar. Rabbi Echia is saying, Bayomar, so God is saying, God said, En amechad, the safa achat lechulam, they're one language. Tachaze, come and see. Maktiv, ve'ibin osam mikedem, my mikedem. What does this mean that they left from the east or whatever that means? That they left from the original place, mikedem. Mikadmono shalolam. They left, they ran away from God, from the primordial one. Mikadmono shalolam. God is the kadmon. God is, kedem means the original. They. God did, so. It means they went off the derech. They went away from God. That's what they even Osam Mikedem. Basically. They rebelled against the Kadmono Shel Olam, the primordial... That's my point. Like, yeah. They weren't actually, wow, what can God do? So. Yeah, so they, they wanted to rebel against him. And what did they find? Veim Tzau. What did they find? This Veim Tzau Vik'ah. What was this discovery that they found? Veim Tzau V'yor'u Mibailei Mai Veim Tzau Ela Metzia that's what Kedem means. What is this Aramaic? They found the Raze, the secrets, the Chochmata Mikadmaye of the early generations, the pre flood generations. The Itna'ar Taman min Bnei Tufna. From the Tufna is flood in Aramaic. From the pre flood generation. The flood generation saw that time's running out. They buried their secrets in this valley. And the, flood gener- the tower generation rediscovered tower the secrets of the, those technologies of the pre-flood generation. And we have to see what those technologies were. 
And so that's what they found. And therefore, and therefore they tried using that technology, Lesarva, to rebel uh, against God. And they did it. Right, right. And the valley itself, the vik'a can mean a valley, but also it can mean like they discovered something. It really means to like split open. They made an uncovering. They right. discovered in Shinar. They made a discovery in, the, in Shinar. So what was the secret wisdom? The Arizal explains. What was the secret wisdom that we're talking about? The Arizal in Likutei Torah says, how, The Arizal is asking, how could it be that God is saying that they will become unstoppable? Why does God almost feel threatened by this? Obviously, God doesn't feel threatened. Like, we're talking metaphorically here. Nothing threatens God. This is just the language. You have to understand the language metaphorically. Because the Arizal is saying, look, but, like, man has free will, yeah, but, like, really? He can't Like, God can't stop them? Obviously, he can stop them. And he did stop them. So what is the point of this language here? Ella, what it's really saying, in Yainamayo, what was their real purpose here? Shayu Yodim Shmotav Shalakadosh Bohu, Vayu Mishtam Shimbo, Maasiot, Vayu Yodin, Kol Malachu Malach, Kefimadragato, Ulazbia Malacha Sholetalav. They knew the secrets of the Holy Tongue, they knew the secrets of creation. God created the world with, in Hebrew, if you know the secrets of Sefer Yetzira, you can create using the language. They knew the secrets of Lashona Kodesh, they were Safa Achat. They knew the divine language. They spoke the divine language. They found the secrets of the divine language. And using that, they can control the angels. They could force the angels to do whatever they want. They knew the names of all the angels. And they could manipulate them. And that's why they had all these incredible technologies. They knew that all the madrigot, all the hierarchy of angels, and how to use one angel to control another, and to manipulate the elements. <clears throat> exactly. Kadabra, exactly. I shall create as I speak. Exactly. Evra You know, abracadabra in Hebrew means Evra, I will create kedibra, like I, sp- like I spoke. That's the secret of abracadabra. It actually comes from really Aramaic. But. Vezeh, this is what it says in Bereshit, in Parashat Bereshit, the Arizal says, Rav Chaim Vital says, based on what he learned from the Arizal, <clears throat> If you remember in the days of Enosh, the grandson of Adam, the Torah says that in the time of the grandson of Adam, at that time, people started to profane the name of God. To call in the name of God. What does that mean? It means that they started to use names, divine names, to manipulate the elements and to manipulate angels. And this is what led to the idolatry People started to idolize so angels and so on. Right. No, as uchal, uchal, they profane. Uh, they profane. used it in a profane way. Shayyodim shimush motav that they knew how to use various divine names. And we we know pirusha metargem the classic explanation here. What does this verse mean in the generation of Enosh? What did they do? That they started to worship idols. What does this mean, idols? What it really means here, that that they created these idols through the manipulation of angels, that they were able to use these idolatrous powers and forces by manipulating the, the, the secrets of the holy tongue. This is the language, this is the power that they had. And it began in the generation of Enosh. That's my question. So if the, 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 the Shona Kodesh, they created the idols so powerful, why God can't allow them everybody to talk? Well, it started with Adam. Originally, Adam was given the secrets of this language, and the first three generations were fine. And then in the times of Enosh, people started to stray, and they started to manipulate angels in a negative way for their own personal benefit. And then there was greed, and then you know how. And then people descend, and by the time of Noach, it was a disaster. And God said, I'm going to let's restart, hit refresh. Noach started again, and again people stray. So then at this point, God is saying, okay, that's enough. Let's confound their languages. Now you understand the punishment. Now the punishment fits the crime. Oh, so they're using the secrets of the holy tongue. I will take away knowledge of the holy tongue. So I have a question too. Yeah. So how do you tie this in with 
That's what, this happened. No, 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 no. That happened right here. The Nephilim happened right here, before the flood, right? The Nephilim was before the flood. That's one of the reasons for the flood. So, one second. And this, it ties exactly into this. You're right. Because we also know at this time, there's this idea of... Yeah, the word fallen angels has the wrong kind of connotation to it. But there were angels that descended to earth. Um, various kinds. There's one class called the Irin, which Aramaic, in Aramaic means the Watchers. Maybe, maybe a very famous name. Maybe you've heard about it. There's a book of Watchers. It's really a section from a book of the book of Hanukh. Which, the, which is an apocryphal text. Remember, apocrypha means it was not included in the Tanakh for various reasons. However, the Zohar does quote from it. Yeah. The Zohar quotes multiple times that Besifra de, uh, de Hanoch, in the book of Hanoch, this and this happened. So remember, Hanoch, Enoch, was the seventh generation from Adam, and it says that he never died, that God took him, yeah. that God took him to, he went to walk with God that Enoch went wherever, he lived 365 years, and then he just, he was gone. God took him. Right. Yeah. So we have a tradition that he transformed into an angel, that God took him and made him into an angel, kind of like Eliyahu later. At the same time, as he went up and became an angel, there were angels that came down to earth. And some of them, also, angels also have a limited amount of free will. And they not so much rebelled against God, but they kind of told God, look at these humans, they're now becoming sinful. They, said, why, they, they told God, why did you make them? And God says, well, you know, if you were down there and you had a yetzerara, if you had free will, if you had an evil inclination, you'd be even worse. And, and so they were put to the test and they came down to earth. And what did they do? They, they saw the sons of man at Benot Adam, and they made it with them. And then they started to do all these sins. And according to these apocryphal books, they started to teach mankind various sins. So it was actually because of these angels that came down to earth that they taught mankind how to make weapons and how, all kinds of things. Even, of beauty, yeah, they, yeah, how to do cosmetics and how to do even, uh, they created the first birth control pill that they were able to, yeah, they were able to stop, um, you know, in order to sin without procreation, like people want to do today, that they, they, were, they made some kind of a potion that would make a woman infertile and all kinds of sins that they, and the, these books even say that they, they started prostitution and all these things. They just descended to such a low level. And that's what, another reason why God had to obliterate and re- hit refresh in the flood generation. And now those secrets and those ideas were revived by the tower generation. So it does very much connect to all this, to the secrets of being able to manipulate angels and angels coming down and being manipulated by humans and so also teaching them brought, secrets. So these people brought angels down. So it could be. There, there's no fallen yes. angel per se, but if they're able to utilize the, name, the names of, uh, of Hashem and control the angels, maybe it's like a genie. It could very well be that the, in the generation of Enosh, they were able to bring these angels down and manipulate them. And then use them to uh, learn all these powerful secrets. And so, what were they trying to do? They wanted to prevent these people in the pre in the tower generation became super proud. They were very powerful. They had all these technologies. They could manipulate angels. They could manipulate the holy tongue. And they wanted to prevent the flood from ever happening again. And they thought that they could even go and take the ultimate name. They could take the name of God. What if we can control God Himself? That was their goal. That was Nasel Anushem. We want to make a name. We want to take over the name, Hashem. Let's take over the name of God. That's what the Arizal is saying. So they only were able to do this because they knew all the holy names in Hebrew and how to manipulate the Hebrew tongue and manipulate creation. Because of course, it's impossible to do in any other language. And this is what is written, which is, as we know, which is, Safachat means the holy tongue, Hebrew. Udvarim achadim, hem mamash shimush shmotav. These dvarim achadim that the Torah is saying that they were of, they had one unified words. What does that mean? They had unified words. They had shimush shmotav idbarach shem achduto. They were using the names of the one God. That's what dvarim achadim means. That their dvarim, they knew the words, the names of the one God. And they can manipulate God who is one. And all of his angels and, and so on. 
So that's why the language was so important. That's why God scattered them, made 70 distinct languages, which since then have split into thousands of different dialects and languages. And it's really important to remember that not only did God confound their languages, we forget this. Like we said earlier, a person was scattered to China. He was now Chinese. That means that he had to also look different. He had different names. And he also had to have a different history. God had to wipe their history, their memory, and to create an alternate history for them so that now they feel like, yeah, I'm Chinese. I've always been Chinese, right? I'm Egyptian. I've always been Egyptian. So he had to create, like, it wasn't just the language that was changed. Everything was changed. Everything was scattered about them. Only certain remnants remained, which is why you find across all 70 root nations from around the world, you have the same common myths. Why is it that in all mythologies from around the world, there's a story of a great flood? Everybody has a story of a great flood. Why? Why does every culture in the world have stories of people coming or angels coming from the sky? Whoever it is, whether it's for the ancient Mexican tribes, the Aztecs and the Mines, the, you know, uh, whoever it is, the feathered serpent, you know, Quetzalcoatl or whoever. Everybody has, or the dragons in China or the Anunnaki in, in Mesopotamia. Every culture has this idea of, you know, even the Hindus have their, the Bhagavad Gita and chariots from this. Everybody has these ideas of, of beings coming down from the sky. Everybody has a story of a flood. All these, there's all these, why? Cultures that were not even related, seemingly, across oceans that never interacted with each other, yet they have the same stories with just different names, basically. Slightly different details, different word, different names, because the common, there's a common origin there. So... God kind of wiped their history and renamed them, but those, those kernels remained. And so every culture developed those same myths about the past. Same players, different Yeah, exactly, exactly. And then, of course, Hebrew was restored to Avraham. God then gave Avraham again, who was, as the story continues, God then chooses Avraham because he would be his holy servant. And then God gives Avraham Hebrew and that's why Lashon HaKodesh is really Ivrit, because Avraham is called Ha'ivri, and so it goes from him now, and then it's called Ivrit, because then Avraham now got the Hebrew again and passed it on to Yitzhak and so on. Although, again, Shem, Melchizedek, and Ever, we say Avraham's uh, grandparents, and who are Noah's grandsons, also had a yeshiva at the time. They, they knew this stuff. They were not wicked, and they didn't participate, and they also would have retained the secrets of, of Hebrew. And finally, oops, what was the tower really? The Talmud in a few places says something amazing. The Talmud in a few places says that our sages learned Ayushonin Shaloshmeot Alachot, 300 laws, Bemigdal Haporeach Be'avir, about a tower that could fly through the sky. Okay, what does that mean? Again, you have those that are, want to keep it simple and say, no, what this means is a migdala porech be'avir means like a, like a kitchen cabinet where you have like a floating shelf. If you build a shelf kind of like in the air, and what does that have to do with like impurities if something's on that shelf? You know, something like that. Something like a, a cupboard that's up high, you know, that's not standing on legs, but that's like attached to a wall or something like that. There's various interpretations of this. Rashi comments in Chagiga where it's mentioned, Yeshomri Migdal Dora Plaga, that this is actually referring to the Tower of Babel. When our sages say that there were 300 laws, Shloshmot Alachot, of a tower that could flow in the sky, that could fly through the sky, the Rashi is bringing one opinion that there are those who say that this is referring to the Tower of Babel that could fly through the sky. So, what was this tower? What were they actually doing? Because the words there say that they wanted to be srefa li srefa. Veni srefa li srefa. What does that mean? Yeah, it seems like they wanted to burn in order to burn. Why would you burn in order to burn? It sounds like they were trying to have some kind of propulsion. Whatever it was, some kind of combustion or propulsion of some sort. And this is where Rav Yonatan Eibeshutz comments, he lived in the 1700s, and he has a very, very famous, in his commentary on the Torah, Tiferet Yonatan, he has a very famous, long passage about what were they actually trying to do. And in short, I'm just going to quote one line from it, because it's very long, but you can read it yourself. Look at what he says. They had a ship that they were going to put 
למעלה מהאוויר העקור, from above the atmosphere, because the atmosphere here is so thick that it's hard to escape. This is the same problem that NASA has. It's very hard to get a payload off of planet Earth. You need lots and lots of fuel. It's very expensive to put things out into space. How do you break again, fly counter to Earth's gravity and break through our atmosphere? And therefore, Rav Yonatan Ibeshut says, 200 and how many years before NASA was started? He says, That's why they wanted to build a tower, very tall, עד למעלה מהאוויר ההיא, above that, or מהאוויר ההוא, above that air, above the atmosphere, ומשם, and from there, יוכלו להשתמש בספינה, then they could use their spaceship, אני אזכר לעיל, לשוט באוויר עד כדור הירחי, הירח, that they could go from there, fly to space, to the moon, and beyond. So what he's saying is that this was a space elevator, that the Migdal was actually, like what today, people propose a space elevator. You can make it a lot cheaper to go off into space if you create an elevator that could take you above Earth's atmosphere. And from there, you don't need much propulsion. Once you're already halfway through to space, you can just... You know, yeah. Uh, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, we're saying that a valley, by the way, doesn't actually mean a valley because we're saying vika means they discovered something. So was it actually a valley? Not necessarily because we're saying the valley really is a secret word. It's actually another word for a, a discovery. They made a discovery in Shinar. So Rav Yontan is suggesting that this was some kind of spaceship or a space elevator and they were really trying to fly very far away. Whatever that means is this was not just a simple tower. These were not ignorant people. They were not just trying to go into the clouds. Yeah, they had serious technology and they could manipulate angels and they could manipulate the elements and they had all these forces. And so measure for measure, because they misused the secrets of Hebrew of the Lashon HaKodesh, God confounded their language and took away their understanding of Lashon HaKodesh. And so that, I mean, that, that basically covers it. I'm just going to conclude with the final words of the Zohar in this whole on Parashat Noach. And he says like this. It's a good message, really, because we're talking so much about speech. So we're talking about, Puma means the mouth. So the Zohar is saying, look at the way that the Torah phrases their punishment. God first confounded their language, and then, and then he was able to spread them and scatter them all over the world. What does that mean? First, he had to take away their knowledge of language. Then they were weak without the language. And then he, was, he could do whatever he wanted with them. And the Zohar continues and says, Aval bezimna de'ate, in the time to come, the future age, the messianic age, what does it say? Maktiv, in Tzfanya, in the prophet Tzfanya, it says, Ki az al elamim, God will transform the language of the nations, safa brura, into a pure language, likro, People will once again call in God's name properly. I remember with Enosh, it started to be profane. People started to misuse the names of God. And idolatry started from there and, and evil and all kinds. So the prophet Svanya is saying, then as God will, will turn it back so that people will to call again properly in the name of God, righteously, and to serve him, shoulder to shoulder as one people, as it says in Zechariah, which we've quoted a lot recently, God will finally be the king over the whole world. God will be one and his name will be one. People will finally recognize the one true God without all the myths and without all the four idols and without all the impure spirits and without all the evil and all the, and the world will reunite into one pure language, a safabura, clear language, and and use it properly in a, in a positive way because ultimately it's all about rectifying speech. In the messianic age, the time that's coming, speech, the Zohar is saying, is the most powerful tool that we have. And when these people were united and were of one language, they could do anything. Speech is our most powerful tool. When we have united speech and we speak properly and we know how to use speech, we, our powers are unlimited. You know, we create our, li- our world, our realities through speech. You speak properly, you speak kindly, you, s- you speak correctly, you will create for yourself a really positive reality. That's why in Hebrew, the word peh 
your mouth is po. We've said that before. You are here. It's spelled the same way. Your reality here is po, pe he. And your mouth is pe, pe he. It's the same word because your reality, what you make right now, what your, your whole world is, you've gotten here through your speech, what you've said, what you didn't say, what, who do you spoke to, who you interact with. Everything comes from the mouth. We create, you know, King Solomon also said that mavet v'chaim be'yad l'shon, that life and death are in the hands of the It all goes back to speech, having pure speech. And this is the highest rectification is to have really pure speech, among other things. But to have pure speech is, is of great significance. That's what the Zohar is saying, that we have to really strive to be of pure speech. When they were united in speech, they were un, you know, li- unlimited. And when God took away that power, suddenly they were weak and he was able to scatter them. And our power also comes through our speech. And in the, f- in the near future, the whole world will finally have rectified speech. We're not going to have people, all the nonsense that we hear today, that the world misuses speech and all the lies and all the fake news and all the anti-Semitism and all, the, all these the things, immorality. all the immorality. And people are convinced through evil speech, people are convinced to go off the derech, to go in all kinds of improper paths in life, to be convinced of all crazy ideas that, you know, 50 years ago were so obvious, so plain and obvious, society is being manipulated in such a grotesque way through really just speech, through media, through social media, through words and videos and images. But a time will soon come where God will convert all the speech into pure speech and finally God will be one. And that's how the Zohar ends with the words as it always does. Baruch Adonai Amen.